Good morning, Rockridge Church. Thank you so much for joining us on another beautiful Sunday morning. We're always so grateful when you set aside the time to come and open your Bible and study it along with us here in the Rockridge Church family. Before we get into that, I just have one big invitation to make to you guys. It is now the month of October, and on the last day of this month, Monday, October 31st, it is my pleasure to invite you to join us for the first Rockridge Church Harvest Festival out here on the property. Our focus on that night will be uh, to do some worship, to have our family come together for fellowship, to have fun with one another, and to share the gospel with whoever comes along who'd like to hear it, uh, because we know we all need it, that's for certain. So again, this is going to take place on Monday, October 31st. We're going to start at 6 p.m. Uh, with some worship music being played live out here on the patio at Rock Ridge. And then when the worship's over, it's just fellowship time. We're going to have a jolly jump for the kids, a trunk or treat for the families, all kinds of like lawn games for us to play together. And we're just going to try to enjoy the fellowship of our brothers and sisters here within the Rock Ridge family and invite our neighbors and friends in the community to come and experience the gospel and experience some family fellowship life uh, in the unique Rock Ridge way that we get to enjoy it out here. So again, that's going to be on Monday, October 31st, starting at 6. If you know that you won't be able to attend that night, but you would still like to help out in some way, you'd still like to support the activity, uh, we are actually taking donations of candy right now to help, you know, fill up bags for that trunk or treat thing we just talked about. Uh, so like I said, if you'd like to support it, but you know you, you can't really be here in person, uh, feel free to reach out to us at pastor at rockridgechurch.org via email or call us at 951-234-6740 uh, for more information on donating candy. All right, that was my big announcement, my big invitation for the day. So let's do what we have actually come together to do this morning. Let's open our Bibles and study the word of our Lord with one another. Uh, we are continuing on in our study of 2 Peter, but before we get to Peter, I'd actually like us to hear a little bit from Paul. So if you'd open up your Bibles first to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and we will start at verse 1, we will go to verse 4. Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preach to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures. I have so enjoyed these first couple of weeks studying Second Peter with you guys. I mean, I, I always enjoy getting to preach for you, but, but I have really, really, really just enjoyed these last couple of weeks because I have been able to, to come up here, to come before you, and talk about really nothing more than the power of the gospel, the power of the gospel of Jesus Messiah. There is nothing that I can stand in this pulpit and tell you about that is more important, more powerful, more essential than that gospel. And that's why we began here in 1 Corinthians 15. Paul said here that we are being saved by the gospel. Notice that that's, that's ongoing. It's active. When we talk about the gospel, we're not just talking about old stories about dead people that happened in a past age. We're talking about the thing of first importance for today, the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Messiah is still the thing of first importance this very day. Because when we talk about that, when we talk about this gospel, we are talking about the very life-giving power of God. We are talking about the fullness of God's love and God's grace and God's mercy being poured out upon us. And that is why the gospel will always be the thing 
of first importance. That's why the gospel will always be sufficient. It will always be enough. And what we've heard from Peter's letter so far is that this gospel is sufficient to give us all of the the things that we desire to have from our spiritual lives, the things that we hunger to experience as Christians. We want faith. We want faith that's effective. We want the best, fullest, and deepest faith. Well, the gospel is enough to give us faith of the highest quality, the highest authority, the greatest truth, the most power, the most preciousness. We want to experience the grace of God. We want to feel it being poured out on us all the time. The gospel is enough to give you or show you the grace of God in abundance, to multiply it in your life. What can show you the grace of God more than the gospel? What is going to tell you about the grace of God more than Christ crucified for your sins? We want to live at peace. Well, what should give us more peace than to know the gospel? To know that we've been justified and have peace with God. To know that our Father in heaven loves us and provides for us, sustains us. To know that the worst possible thing that can happen to us in this world is that we might die and wake up in eternity with Christ. We get to know the end in the middle of our lives. What could give us more peace than that? The gospel is the good news of peace. That's what Paul calls it in Romans 5.1. Since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus. Jesus Christ. But maybe more than any of those other things, maybe the thing we desire to experience most from our spiritual life is the power to live spiritually. We want to know above all else that we really are different now because of our faith, because that's what the Word says. We don't want to be the kind of people who just go around saying, we've been born again. We've been made into new creations. We're now filled with the Spirit of God. We want to be able to experience that. We want to be able to to actually know what what it means and what it feels like to have this new birth into new life, to be this new thing, this new person. We want to be able to point to things that we can see to be able to to point to the fruit of our movement from death and our trespasses to life in Christ. Well, I have good news for you. Even for that, the gospel is enough. The gospel is enough to cleanse you from your sins right now, to give you that newness of life right now, that's so powerful, it, it's not just talked about, it's, it's experienced and, and it's lived out. And the gospel is enough to give you eternal life in the future. Peter will say again, as, as we'll see this morning, so I get to tell you again, that the gospel is sufficient. If you want to go out and live a life that's pleasing to God, a life that could be called holy or godly, will look no further than the one thing that you need most of all. The gospel. The good news of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. That is the power for your salvation. We're going to pray, and then we're going to pick it up at 2 Peter chapter 1, and verse 3. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the time that you've given us today to study it. God, we thank you for the fellowship of this family. Let all of us who are gathered here today to hear this message, to hear your word preached, Lord, let our hearts be filled with humility. Humility to actually hear your word, to be cut by it, to be broken by it, to be built back up and edified by it. 
Lord, let it penetrate into the deepest areas of our hearts and our mind. And let us learn today. Let us be reformed today. Lord, let us walk in truth and in step with your Spirit today as we open up your Word. In your glorious name, Lord Jesus, we pray and we ask for your help. Amen. His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. That's how Peter starts verse 3 there in 2 Peter chapter 1. And notice how Peter has again grounded everything in the grace and glory of God. For us, this is all received stuff. It all moves in one direction. And it's been that way Really, this entire time we've been reading 2 Peter. He talks about faith. That faith is received by God's righteousness. He talks about grace and peace. Grace and peace are multiplied to us by knowing God. And now he says we have everything that we need to live the godly life by his divine power. It is again given to us. Do you remember the story of Elijah, when he went up against the priests of the old idol Baal. The power of God was certainly on display that day on Mount Carmel. Yahweh sent fire down from heaven to consume the offering on the altar that had been built for him. And all the Israelites who were gathered there that day knew that they had just seen the awesome power of the one true living God. So they fell on their faces, and they said over and over again, Yahweh is God. Yahweh, He is God. When we think of God's power, these are the stories that we most likely tend to remember. We think of things like seas being parted, water shooting out from the rocks, fire falling from heaven, axe heads floating on top of the water. Young men standing in a fiery furnace without being burned. Unclean spirits being cast out of people. The sick and the lame being healed. Lazarus walking out of his tomb alive. Things that certainly only our God can accomplish. What Peter said here is that every time you see someone living the godly life, you are witnessing that very same divine power of God that was so powerfully demonstrated among the Israelites there on Mount Carmel. The same power of God that parted the Red Sea. The same power of God that called Lazarus to walk out of his tomb. Again, things that only God is capable of doing. Every time we manage to actually live in obedience to God. We are keeping in step with His Spirit rather than gratifying our own flesh. And we are experiencing that same power of God. God is accomplishing something through us. Peter finds the power of God being demonstrated in his people simply living godly lives. I think we should too. We know that before God put his spirit in us, we only ever lived according to our own flesh. Our mind thought of nothing else. Our mind was set on the flesh. We were totally hostile to God, totally incapable of submitting to his word, totally unable to please him. That's Romans chapter 8. We were totally depraved. Our whole person was enslaved to sin. Our whole person was bound for death. We couldn't even take the first step towards godly living apart from his saving grace given to us by his divine power and sovereignty. As Paul says in Galatians chapter 3 at verse 3, we begin by the Spirit so we can never be perfected by the flesh. God must dwell within us 
before we're even capable of considering his will, his ways, what would please him instead of ourselves. Our salvation, which includes every step of our sanctification, our being made holy, is entirely a work of God. It is given to us sola gratia by his sheer grace alone. That means all of our fruit bearing, anything that we might do that accords with God's word and pleases him, anything we might accomplish that we could point to and say, look, look, I I did the godly thing. I lived in obedience today. I was productive for the Lord. All of it is a work of his power. All of it is the outworking of his grace. Our holiness is as much a demonstration of the power of God as fire coming down from the sky. And we should treat our fruit bearing like it is that. We should treat our fruit bearing much like Peter and John treated the healing of a lame beggar back in Acts chapter 3. You might remember this this eyewitness account. They, They healed a man who from his birth had been unable to walk. Every day, friends of this guy brought him to the beautiful gate of the temple there in Jerusalem to ask for charity. That was how he spent his days. And then, one day, he meets Peter and John. And they don't have any money to give him, but what they do have, they give him. He was healed in an instant. And for the first time, after a lifetime of disability, He walks. He walks all over the temple. He jumps. He's praising God. Of course, everyone noticed. A man who's never walked before is now walking freely like everyone else. He's jumping all over the place. And they were amazed by what they saw. The man goes back to Peter and John. And the crowds followed. And they're astounded. And they're eager to know how this could have happened. By what power did the apostles heal this man? So Peter spoke to them. And what he told them in Acts 3.12 was, Men of Israel, why do you wonder at this? Why do you stare at us as though by our own power we made him walk? And he says a couple other things. And in verse 16, he finally tells them where this power came from. He says it's by Jesus' name, by faith in his name that this lame man was made well. So every time that we actually live out our holiness, every time that we actually bear fruit in keeping with our faith, in keeping with the gospel and the will of God, we should react the same way. Why would you look at us as though by our own power this happened? Don't marvel at us. Because it's never by our own power that we bear fruit. And we should certainly never marvel at ourselves. It is by Jesus' name, by faith in his name, that we, the spiritually lame, can walk. It is by his name that we, fallen, broken, sinful, yet redeemed people, can live differently, can live righteously. Our godliness is a demonstration of the divine power of our Lord. He graciously gives to us all that we need to live in this new way. As Peter writes, continuing on in verse 3, God's power gives us exactly everything that we need for the godly life through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence. The word we translate as knowledge there is once again that Greek term epigenosis, which we talked a lot about last week. That means it's not just knowing about God, but truly knowing him. Really knowing the one who calls us to godliness and equips us with everything that we need. Knowing him because he reveals himself to us and grants us relationship with him. That means we are prepared for holy lives through our epigenosis knowledge of God, knowing him as only he can let himself be known. God gives us the power 
for remarkable total life change the same way that he multiplies to us grace and peace through the gospel of Jesus Christ, which allows us to have this relationship with God, which allows us to know God in this relational, complete way through the outpouring of his grace in the completed work of Jesus, our Lord and Savior. If you want to live a godly life, if you want to experience the saving and sanctifying power of God, if you want to bear fruit for God, then know God. Receive and believe in the gospel. The gospel is sufficient for this. It is the very grace of God. Every word of the gospel is the grace of God. And in it is all we need for a godly life. Through the death and resurrection of Jesus Messiah, we are born again. We are made into new creations. Christ himself now lives in us. We are new creations made for new lives, lives of holiness and not corruption, lives of abundant life and not death, lives of freedom and not slavery, lives of the Spirit and not the flesh. As Peter says here in verse 4, God doesn't just change who we are. God changes what we are fundamentally through the gospel by his unmerited favor towards us we are allowed to share in the very nature of God. It is, in some sense, added to us. Through our knowledge of Christ, here's what Peter says in verse 4, he has granted to us his precious and very great promises, so that through them you may become partakers in the divine nature, having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. So by God's divine power, he allows us to share in his divine nature. Now, that's kind of a confusing verse. I know it's one that there's been a lot of debate over. But what Peter seems to mean is is that God, through the gospel, has rescued us from the corruption of this world. And that is how he allows us to share in his nature. The world is in rebellion to God. As James says in James 4.4, 4, the world is in enmity with God. And anyone who desires to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. So because God rescues us from that corruption, rescues us from the world, and sets us apart from it, we are a little bit more like him. We know he's ransomed us from the world with the precious blood of the spotless lamb. And that's the starting point of us sharing in his nature. We get to experience some of his set-apartness, his holiness, his total separation from sin. Our God is holy, but even just to say that isn't quite saying enough because he's not just holy, he is maximum perfect holiness. The angels gathered around his throne call out about his holiness. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. God is so holy that when Isaiah saw him in a vision, this comes from Isaiah 6, he immediately knew himself to be a man of unclean lips from an unclean people. And he thought because of the powerful separation from his sinfulness to God's holiness that he might die just from having seen this perfect, holy God. But listen to the grace of God. Listen to the grace of God, because this is what it says. God says we will not die because of his holiness and his glory and our sinfulness. In fact, the grace of God shares those essential parts, his holiness and his glory those essential parts of his nature. He shares them with us. Our sins get forgiven by the blood of Jesus. That holy, holy, 
holiest God adopts us. He makes himself our father. and He makes us to be more like him. That's what sanctification is. He makes us more holy in this life right now because he is holy and we are his children and we are to bear the image of our father. His gospel promises that he will someday raise us from the grave and glorify us, making us imperishable, immortal, unfading, just as he is. Our final state is to share in the holiness and glory of God. This is how God gives us all we need for our godly living here and now. It's all from the cross of Christ. That's how God rescued us from rebellion and corruption, set us apart from the world. That's how he makes us more like him. If you've ever wondered what the point of this verse is, what Peter could possibly be talking about when he writes that we partake in the divine nature, it's that the gospel is sufficient to make us more holy, to make us more like our Father. The gospel is enough for us to live holy, fruit-bearing, godly lives here and now. That's what that verse means. It also means that, that we do that by the totally unearned grace and power of God. We do that because of what God has given to us. And apart from that, apart from God's grace, apart from God's mercy, we couldn't please him for a single moment without God taking the initiative to deliver to us this gospel, to make it real through the incarnation, life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, we could never be brought out of that state of total depravity, absolute slavery, and death. Without the gospel, we remain unregenerated. We remain the enslaved enemies of God. There are men and women in this world who we would love to call great ones of God. People who seem to be the most productive, doing the most for the kingdom. People who seem to be the most sanctified, living the holiest lives. We learn about them. We watch them. We look upon their works and we think, man, now there's a Christian who I wish I could be like. I wish I could be like that man. I wish I could be like that woman. I wish I could be a great missionary, a powerful globe-trotting evangelist. I wish I could be a, a generous giver, a productive writer, an inspiring preacher, a church grower, a leader. I wish I could be a great man or a great woman for God of God. What we have learned this morning, what we've talked about, tells us that the idea of the great man and the great woman of God is more myth than it is reality. That there really simply is no such thing. Because our productivity, the great works that we do, well, they aren't our own. We don't bear fruit by our own power. So there are no great men of God. There are no great women of God. There are only trees planted by streams of water. You might remember that from Psalm 1.1. Blessed is the man. That's how the psalm begins. That phrase means that, that this person's life is to be admired and commended. This person is living the good life. Blessed is the man who delights in the law of Yahweh, and on his law he meditates day and night. Go down to verse 3 there. He's like a tree planted by streams of water that yields fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. And all that he does, he prospers. Blessed is the man, or the woman, who is simply like the tree. The tree, which cannot plant itself, 
cannot water itself. The tree which bears fruit and prospers only because it has received good things in abundance. Only because it has received good water. There are no great men or women of God. There are only men and women who have received great grace and great mercy. Men and women who have been made new, who were fallen and redeemed. Men and women who have had their very natures transformed by the grace and power of God through his gospel. Men and women who took very seriously what Peter writes here, that they now share in the divine nature of God. There are only trees bearing fruit because they are sustained by God's streams of water. Perhaps we should prefer the way Jesus puts it in John's Gospel, chapter 15. We are only branches on the true vine, bearing fruit because of what the vine gives to us. This is from John 15, starting at verse 4. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If you want to be able to look at your life and say that you could be a, you're a great man or a great woman of God, if you want to be someone great for the kingdom of God, well then receive this message as good news. Because it says you already have all that you need. If you believe in the gospel of Jesus Christ, if you can call on God as Father, if you can call on Jesus as God and Lord and Savior, you have everything you need. God has lit richly provided all this for you. He has revealed Himself to you. He's given you relationship with Him. He's forgiven your sins. So if you want to be great, well then don't try to be great. Don't try to be a great evangelist, a great missionary, a great writer, a great thinker. Just go be a tree. If you want to experience God's life-giving, life-changing power, if you want to bear fruit in abundance, if you want to live the godly life, then just be a branch on the vine. God's sheer grace is the basis for the set-apart Christian life. Whatever good we do is completely sourced in what God has already done. It is completely sourced in His power, His truth, His gospel. God has given us all we needed for godly living. The beauty of the gospel is that sharing in the divine nature is not the prize at the end of a very long journey. It is not the thing at the top of a very long staircase of suffering. Sharing in God's nature is actually the starting point of the godly life. Getting to taste just a little bit of his holiness, a little bit of his perfection, getting his spirit inside of us, that's what allows us to bear fruit. It's not our great reward for bearing it over our lives. It should probably tell us a lot that Peter says that we partake of God's nature before he gives us this list of, of good fruit to bear that you find at verse 5. It's as if he's saying, God has already given you this, so you can go and do that. God has truly given you all you need. He's given you part of his very nature. So now go. Go and do the things that he has equipped you to do. Go and live the godly life. That's what Peter seems to be saying as he moves ahead. That because we know that God has given us all these, all these blessings. God has given us faith and grace and peace, and he's even allowed us to share in his nature, and he's given us everything we need to, to live a holy life. Because we know all that, 
Let's go do it. Because God's given us everything we need to live this beautiful life, let us be found living beautifully. We'll pick it up at verse 5. For this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue, and virtue with knowledge. We encounter that word knowledge again. Now this time he's actually using that Greek term gnosis. So what he's saying here is be good. That's the virtue part. So be virtuous and go and learn all you can about God. Go and learn what pleases God. Go and learn the will of God. Read his word. Be among fellow Christians. Be discipled. Go to church and hear the word taught and preached by the elders. To borrow the language of Hebrews 5.14, do all that you can to graduate from milk to meat, to grow in maturity in your knowledge of the scriptures. And this is where I get to tell you, unlike last week, uh, go read men like Spurgeon and Calvin and Luther and, and Bonhoeffer, these men who dedicated their lives to understanding the word and glean from their wisdom. Glean from the, the, the great things that they came to understand about Jesus and the gospel. We'll move on to verse 6. And knowledge with self-control, and self-control with steadfastness, and steadfastness with godliness, and godliness with brotherly affection. And we'll, we'll pause there too. Because that one stands out, brotherly affection. Love for the family of God's people is regarded by the New Testament scriptures as one of the most certain, one of the surest signs of our election and our regeneration, our, our born-againness. Jesus commanded us to love one another. He affirmatively said that the world is to know that we belong to him by how deeply and how truly we love our brothers and sisters. You get to the letter of 1 John, and John says there in 1 John chapter 5 at verse 1 that if we don't have love for our brothers and sisters, we can't possibly have been born of God. And perhaps the only fruit that we can bear that is a more genuine sign of our salvation, of our relationship with God, is what Peter puts at the end of this list. He just he ends it with love. Supplement your brotherly affection with love. Peter writes specifically there about agape love. That's the Greek term. And that word denotes a love that is self-sacrificial, that is steadfast. It is love that is always seeking the good of the other. Love that is never given for the purpose of receiving anything in return. It is costly love freely given. It is the love that God gives to us. Because according to 1 John chapter 4, at verse 16, if you get into the Greek there, agape is the kind of love that God is. In that verse where John says so simply, God is love, that's the kind of love he, he's pointing to there. That's the word he uses. God is agape love. Notice that Peter as he writes about this, he, he again roots everything in the grace and power of God. He says in verse 8, if you have these qualities, if they're increasing in your life, then you're not being ineffective or unfruitful with your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now here he's used that word epigenosis again. You are not being unproductive with what God has given you. You're not being ineffective with, with God revealing himself to you and giving you relationship with him. If you have these qualities, what Peter's saying effectively is it tells us you have the gospel. You believe in the gospel, and this is the gospel bearing fruit in your life. And then he talks about those who, who fail to have these qualities. Notice he doesn't say that they're, they're not saved or or they've walked away, he just says they have forgotten the gospel. This is from verse 9. For whoever lacks these qualities is so nearsighted that he is blind, having forgotten that he was cleansed from his former sins. They have forgotten the very heartbeat and foundation 
of the good news, the atoning sacrifice of Jesus Messiah, which takes away our sins. It's a big thing to forget that. To forget that we have been forgiven is also to forget that we are part of God's elect that we have been chosen by God, that we are loved by God. To forget that we've been forgiven is to forget that we really have been regenerated, that we've been justified, that we have a relationship with God and we've been made new. It's to be so nearsighted that you are blind to the very grace and mercy of God that's been given to you. Uh, let's keep going with Peter. Let's pick it up at verse 12. Uh, We'll read to what is really the end of this section, uh, which is at verse 15. This is kind of Peter's purpose statement for the whole letter. He says, Therefore, I intend always to remind you of these qualities, though you know them and are established in the truth that you have. I think it right, as long as I am in this body, to stir you up by way of reminder since I know that the putting off of my body will be soon, as our Lord Jesus Christ made clear to me, and I will make every effort so that after my departure, you may be able at any time to recall these things. I find, I find it fascinating what Peter says in verse 12 there. He says, I'm writing to remind you of these qualities, though you know them and are established in the truth that you have. He's writing to a group of people to remind them about something that he he admits that they already know. Why do people do that? Well, I think we do that. I think we remind each other of stuff that, that we know we already know when we notice that the other person isn't, isn't really taking it seriously. That maybe they know it somewhere in their head, but but they aren't really applying it. It's not not being lived out. They aren't living as if these things are true. So we remind them. Not because we think they've forgotten, but we remind them so that we can call them back to this stuff and kind of demand that they take it seriously. You know, I know you already know this stuff, but need I remind you that it's really true? It's as if Peter's saying, I'm writing because I know you know this stuff, but I really need you to know it now. He would be doing this because of the prevalence of false teachers in the church and the popularity that they seem to have and how effective they seem to be at leading people astray. That's the opposite of bearing good fruit, being so easily led astray. So Peter writes and says, listen, I'm worried about you guys. I know you know this gospel stuff. I know we've talked about it. I know it was preached to you. And you, you accepted it. You said that you know it. But, but the way you guys are following these, these bad teachers and their bad ideas, man, maybe you need to, to be reminded of it. Peter knows that they're at risk of being led astray by people who are only here to exploit them with big, empty promises, possibly of a truer faith, or, or a greater salvation, or, or that there's really no need to live a holy life because who knows if Jesus is really coming back anyway. That's a big part of 2 Peter chapter 3. So Peter writes to them to remind them of the thing that they need to take most seriously. The gospel. The sufficiency, the reality, the truth, and the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. He's writing to them essentially to let them know they don't need these false teachers. They don't need their bad ideas. They already have everything they need. They started with the gospel. So they started with enough. The gospel is God's power for salvation for all who believe. That's Romans chapter 1 verse 16. I think in that there's There's a powerful word for us to think about here. Because it's not uncommon that that in the Christian spiritual life, you know, lived out long enough, that you'll hit a season where you feel like, man, I'm really not experiencing a bold faith. Man, I just don't feel like I'm on fire for this stuff. Or maybe you're saying, 
man, this is a really chaotic time. Why don't I feel any peace? I don't feel peace about anything. Maybe there's been some stumbling. And now you're feeling like, like you don't know if you're really being sanctified. Like maybe you've fallen back into some old patterns and, and you realize that there's still so much temptation around you and, and there's still so much weakness in your life. And, and man, you don't know if you're really being, being made more holy. Well, as we think about this stuff, I get to tell you this morning that if any of that has crossed your mind, if any of that relates to your experience, it is not because the gospel of Christ is somehow lacking. That's really the point Peter's making. He's gone to great lengths so far in this letter to show his readers that the gospel lacks nothing and offers everything. That means we have a promise in these scriptures that all we need for godliness, for grace, for peace, for faith, like the apostles, we have. It's all there for us in the gospel of Christ. So perhaps we're the problem. Maybe we're guilty of being a little bit nearsighted. Perhaps we've started to forget that we've been cleansed of our former sins. Perhaps we've started to forget how great and glorious this gospel is and what it really means that Jesus Christ went to the cross and died so that we could be forgiven. So let me kind of be Peter here for a moment and stir you up by way of reminder. I know you know this stuff, but now's the time that you need to really know it. Let me be a voice that calls you back to this gospel. If you've been struggling with any of the stuff we've talked about right here, let me ask you this question. How much time do you spend in the Word of God? You feel weakness in your life. You feel like you're in turmoil and not peace, you don't feel like you're experiencing God's grace, how much time do you spend in the Word of God? How much time do you spend just engaging with the gospel of Jesus Christ as it lives in the Scriptures? Do you spend any time at all just reading it, praying about it, being alone with it and, and reflecting on it? Do you spend any time thinking about what it means that God has forgiven your sins and made you a new person, made you a new creation? Do you ever sit and think about what it means that you share in his divine nature and that by his divine power, he has given you blessings in abundance? Do you think about what it means that to experience new life, you've been given everything you need? Let me remind you of these things. The gospel of Christ is true. The gospel is real. And the gospel is enough. Because the power of God to rescue us from the corruption and sin and death of this world lives in this gospel. It is perfect. It is complete. Through it, you have been saved. You are being saved. You will be saved. Your sins have been forgiven. God has rescued you. You have been given part of the very holiness and glory and love that are who God is. Nothing else can give you what the gospel has already given you. So stop looking for it from others. Stop looking for it from other places. If you want to live the holy, godly life, return to the gospel. Take it seriously. Live as if it's real and meaningful. Grow in knowledge of God. Go and learn everything you can about God. Be diligent to bear fruit and so confirm that you belong to God's people. Bear all the fruit that you can to make your calling and election sure. The gospel is sufficient. The gospel is enough.
We're going to pray together, and then we're going to worship together. Dear Jesus, we thank you for this gospel. Lord, we thank you that the power of salvation is contained in the good news that the once-for-all sacrifice of our Lord has been made to forgive us of our sins, to give us new life, to give us union with your very Spirit. Lord, thank you that we are born again, that we are your handiwork, and not the handiwork of the world or even ourselves. Lord Jesus, we thank you for our atonement, our justification, our regeneration, and someday our glorification, all of which is contained in this gospel. Lord, help us that this good news may bear fruit and abundance in our lives, that we may grab hold of the power of this gospel and go and live lives that please you, that give you glory, that send out the message of your good news to the world. In your glorious name, dear Jesus, we beg for your help to do this well. Amen. Thank you so much for your time and attention today. I'm going to hand it off to Chris now so we can worship together. In the morning When I rise In the morning When I rise In the morning when I rise, give me Jesus. Give me Jesus. Give me Jesus. You can.
you can name all this world. Just give me Jesus.